let us do some self-introductions of our guests. Um, Carla, over to you. Tell us about your background. What have you been doing? <laughs> Gee whiz. I was born in a small farm in No. I'm Carla Robbins. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, and I run a master's program at Baruch College in international affairs. And I am a recovering journalist. I'm, was, <laughs> as is the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And very honored to be here. Good. And Carla's job it is to try and maintain peace, harmony, and order between me and him. Over to you. <laughs> Ian Bremmer, former Prime Minister of Australia. <laughs> <laughs> And I run a very profitable geopolitical risk company <laughs> called Eurasia Group. And I earn more money than him. <laughs> if it was that way. Right. <laughs> Back to you. Restore order. Ian, if I might start with you. Um, can you just give us a quick assessment of where the war is right now between Russia and Ukraine? Um, and last week, my former colleagues at the Times reported that senior Russian generals um, recently discussed when and how Moscow might use a tactical nuclear weapon. You know, how seriously should we take that threat with the caveat that tactical nuclear weapons is a very general term. They could go from a fraction of a kiloton to something larger than what we dropped on Hiroshima. But I'm, under any conditions, it's pretty terrifying. Well, I mean, first, the fact is this war has been going on for about nine months now. And it's generally been escalating in terms of the danger that it poses to the geopolitical order and, of course, to the global economy pretty much straight through those nine months. Uh, this has gone horribly badly for Russia. The Ukrainians have been suffering immensely uh, as a consequence uh, of that. Uh, and increasingly, the potential that it's dragging in the West in a way that is going to have longer term implications is also growing. So I don't have great news on that front. Um, the, the, the good news is, is that the ability and willingness of the West to coordinate in punishing the Russians and supporting the Ukrainians has been strong and consistent. And despite what has been said by some on the progressive left and some on the MAGA right, I don't think that's going to meaningfully change in 2023. In other words, the U.S. is going to provide the majority of the military support, um, and the Europeans are going to continue to provide the majority of the financial support, and that together will, will prevent the Russians um, from being able to go back into Kiev. Uh, but uh, the fact that the Russians are doing so badly and that Putin has had to announce a mobilization of 300,000 troops, which he didn't want to do, um, has led Russia to start taking other steps that they hadn't been taking, like going after civilian um, electricity infrastructure in Ukraine. And if you watch state media in Russia, and I don't suggest you do that um, because it's not good for you, um, but, but when I do, it's, it's very clear. I mean, the Russians are now admitting they're losing territory. They're admitting it's going badly, but it's not because they're fighting the Ukrainians. It's because they're fighting NATO. So the big question is not for me about tactical nukes, though we can get into that conversation. It's about whether or not the Russians are going to turn the war towards NATO. Will they engage in asymmetrical strikes against pipelines, fiber, uh, cyber attacks, espionage that would actually hit NATO and especially NATO frontline countries? The, I think that's an enormous concern. And unlike the use of a tactical nuke, which would elicit an immediate and extraordinary American response against Russian forces in Ukraine and the Black Sea, and they know that, the response that would come from NATO if the Russians just engage in asymmetrical warfare against NATO is, is hard to know uh, because, I mean, they're, they're being sanctioned maximally and the provision of weapons and training and, and intelligence, I mean, that, that's been about as high as anyone wants to go short of steps that they think would potentially really escalate the war directly. So, so the West will be in a difficult position if Putin decides that's where he wants to go. Final point for me on this is that we need to understand that the, one of the reasons I'm so negative about this is because I don't see 
how the Russians end up in a normal position. Like at least in 1962, when the Cuban Missile Crisis you know, brought the, war, the world to the brink of nuclear confrontation, when both sides decided to step back, they were at the status quo ante. The Soviets were still the Soviets, the Americans were still the Americans. Th this time around, like as we look forward over the next one, two, three, five years, under any circumstances, Putin's Russia will look like a rogue state. We'll, we'll, we'll have an economy which is collapsing. We'll, we'll be on the back foot against Ukraine, which will be the best armed state in Europe with an expanded NATO that's getting into the EU. I, I don't know how you stabilize that vis-a-vis -vis Putin's Russia, and I don't think Putin's going anywhere anytime soon. So I do think this is a truly dangerous turn of events structurally for the geopolitical order. Becoming a giant Iran sort of thing. Exactly. So I'm a little puzzled, though. I mean, I hope you're right. Um, I hope um, I'm not. Uh, no, I hope you're right in terms of, of aid holding together short of, short of uh, some sort of asymmetric warfare you know, driving. And it is extraordinary the way the alliance has held together up until now. It's going to be a very cold winter for the Europeans. And in a way that you know, I'm not sure we could tolerate here. And it is, you know, let's face it, tomorrow, odds are that the Republicans are going to take both chambers. And we've heard not just from Marjorie Taylor Greene, but we've heard from Kevin McCarthy that the blank check is over with for Ukraine. Do you not believe that? Oh, no. I mean, I believe that. I don't think that they're getting a blank check. And I think that that, that statement was taken wildly out of um, context uh, by those that are incented to do so. But that's not useful in terms of understanding where the Republicans are going. I mean, overwhelmingly, the Republicans support Ukraine and will continue to. Uh, and I, I don't think that was the message that came from McCarthy at all. I think and you've got Lend-Lease, which can be extended through 2023. Um, you've got this Congress that can provide funding that'll last through the end of next year. And I don't think the Republicans are planning on cutting everything off. So I'm not worried about that. And I'm also not worried about the Europeans this winter. Um, they've done an extraordinary job in getting their gas storage uh, to levels that even if you had a relatively robust winter in Europe, and so far, thankfully, it's been quite mild, they'd be able to get through it as long as they're prepared to subsidize poorer Europeans, and they are. Next year is a problem. Next year is a problem for the US, assuming Trump is moving towards a Republican nomination and he is the guy that's most willing to give um, leverage to room to run for Putin. And it's a problem for the Europeans because then they're gonna be under a lot more economic stress and maybe the Russians will have taken steps against Europe at that point as well that are beyond what we're looking at. And you'll have a whole bunch of Europeans that are saying, why are we continuing to, to, to provide this kind of sacrifice when the Americans are doing so much better. So I do worry about 2023. I, I want to turn to, to Kevin, and I'm, I'm going to come back to you on this asymmetric warfare question, because I'm intrigued by it, but I'm going to turn to Kevin. So you wrote in Foreign Affairs a piece that I heartily commend to everyone. Um, and I also commend G0 has an extraordinary newsletter every morning, which I signal, which I commend. Um, you wrote in Foreign Affairs that she... And you're from the Council of Foreign Relations, which produces Foreign Affairs, so we should commend you, too. <laughs> I, have, I have nothing to do with... I have nothing, nothing to do with that. <laughs> Can I commend you for something? But, yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. But, uh, Ian wears nice socks. Uh, <laughs> Ian koalas has, on Kevin's socks, just so you know that. And yeah. if you... Yeah, yeah. Okay, if we're going to do this, and if you okay. haven't watched Puppet Regime, you're yeah. really missing something, so... <laughs> so she has pushed... You wrote in Foreign Affairs that she has pushed politics to the Lenin, Leninist left economics to the Marxist left, and foreign policy to the nationalist right. And that his nationalism is, quote, fueling an assertiveness abroad that has replaced the traditional caution and risk aversion that were the hallmarks of the Dung era. So that now that she has had his coronation at the party Congress, do you expect even more assertiveness regionally or globally? And I personally have been surprised, but I will say this, I'm not a sinologist, that she hasn't done more to help Putin in Ukraine. And do you think that might change now, or is it all about Taiwan? I think Xi Jinping's view of um, <clears throat> Putin is that Xi Jinping thinks Putin's a dummy. Um, <laughs> a dummy for having gone off half-cocked in a military invasion of another state when you weren't military, militarily or, frankly, economically and financially prepared to do that. But while Putin might be a dummy, he's my dummy, uh, that is. 
Uh, he's China's dummy. He's on our team. So there will therefore be no public breaking of ranks on this question. <clears throat> Despite the attempts at what I describe as diplomatically crab walking your way away from 100% endorsement of the, of the Russian position. You saw that at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization conference recently, <clears throat> where Xi Jinping was sending out different messages and causing a Putin to say that he was happy to be in Samarkand to hear China's, quote, questions and concerns. That sounds not like the Vladimir that you and I know. That sounds like a script given to him by the Chinese. But I think the really interesting thing in terms of distancing stuff, uh, which goes to your question before about tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine, was the statement he made in Beijing with Olaf Scholz in the visit by the German Chancellor just the other day, where he said, um, my paraphrase is, uh, that nuclear weapons can never be used to settle disputes on the vast Eurasian landmass. Well, Ukraine is in Eurasia. Um, and without using the U word, Ukraine, or the R word, Russia, what he was saying is, Putin, don't even think about it. And so the public distancing in that statement off the back of the uh, visit by uh, Olaf Schultz, I thought, was uh, uh, significant. And if it was simply posturing, which I think on balance it must have been on Putin's part, it still doesn't explain the extent which the administration here went into overdrive about a month ago uh, in its public briefing campaign and asking all sorts of uh, folks to place as much leverage as possible on the Chinese, to put leverage on the Russians, not to even think about this. So let's hope, as Ian says, this has been put to one side. The actual threat of the use of tactical nuclear weapons, large or small. On the broader question of where now with Chinese um, strategic and foreign policy, now that He's got through narrowly the 20th Party Congress with a vote of 2,280 votes to zero. Um, <laughs> there was one dissenting vote. He's now on a bus to Xinjiang, and so uh, very slow bus. The, um, did, did, do you think who was potentially uh, he's on a the dissenting second bus? Vote? He's on I the see. second bus. Yeah, it's a, it's a mini bus with Hu Jintao. We can come back to that if you'd like. Yeah. I would love to come back. To that. <laughs> the, yes. uh, is that now he's through that? Your core question is, therefore, does China become um, systemically more assertive because nationalism continues, uh, as we've seen evidence in the 10 years of his period in office so far? I think it's going to go through two phases. And here is my prediction, which can be shot down in flames fairly soon if it proves not to be the case. Phase one, uh, from about now and for a few years to come, I think the, uh, the uh, overriding strategic impulse in Xi Jinping's office at present will be to try and stabilise things um, for the short to medium term. There's simply too much going on around the world which is uncertain and injurious to Chinese un underlying interests. Russia, Ukraine being one on balance. Uh, second, the state of the Chinese domestic economy, which uh, is in more trouble now uh, than we've seen at any time since the global financial crisis and arguably since the recession which followed uh, the crackdown and imposition of sanctions between 89 and 92 after Tiananmen. So he's got headwinds geopolitically with Russia, headwinds with the domestic economy, headwinds with the global economy. Uh, <clears throat> because uh, of the various macroeconomic levers being pulled in terms of a higher monetary, uh, a more restrictive monetary policy regime, which, which draws growth down. I think the, over, the overriding imperative at the moment, as they perceive it, is to tactically stabilise. Um, so um, that doesn't mean everything is off as far as Taiwan is concerned, but they do not want, for those reasons, to play with fire in terms of bringing on a Taiwan crisis by accident. Furthermore, if it turned into a real shooting match, the overwhelming position in Beijing at the moment is that they are still too much conscious of what could go wrong. Um, that is, there is not a 110% guarantee of victory. And under those circumstances, Chinese strategic doctrine historically tells you to be cautious. Um, line one of Xun Art of War 
uh, which is etched into the cerebral cortex of every Chinese leader, is war is a great matter of state not to be taken lightly. If you lose the war, you lose the state. And so therefore, if you're going to actually engage in armed conflict and you can't win without firing a shot, which is the other stated precept of Chinese strategic policy, then you wait until you can do a Norman Schwarzkopf and shock and awe your way to a victory, which is what Putin did not do. So my prediction for the immediate period ahead, I can't put a timeline around it, but it's, is if they can pull it off, starting with the uh, summit with uh, President Biden in Bali next week, which I think will happen, we should get ready for some signs, I think, of some sort of stabilisation, while they still, for the medium to long term, prepare for what they still see as the unavoidability of confrontation fundamentally with the United States over Taiwan when they are more prepared militarily and economically to win. And the, re the readout from Schultz's uh, very brief trip was very much in line with that and very constructive. But I, I agree with you on this for a broader reason, uh, which is that if we look at Putin's horrible misjudgment to invade Ukraine, we have to understand that as, as, as well orchestrated as the alliance has been in response to February 24th, in the run-up to February 24th, every signal that was being given to Putin was pretty much that this is gonna be an opportune time for you to take a munch, right? I mean, you look at where the US was on Afghanistan and how the allies reacted to that. You look at Merkel no longer being there. You look at France and strategic autonomy. Biden met with Putin and when he did um, back a year and a half ago, he wasn't talking about Ukraine, he was talking about cyber and the colonial pipeline. You know what? Putin responded on that and he rolled those guys up and he said, okay, we'll stop hitting you on critical infrastructure. And then Xi Jinping met with Putin and said, yes, you're our best friend on the global stage. So I really do believe that Putin had lots of reasons pre-February 24th to think this is not gonna be such a big deal. Now, he also made huge misjudgments on the state of his military, which is a different story. But in terms of how he assessed mm. the international community and the response, mm. I don't think Putin was so off mm. in terms of what he had seen coming um, to him. Where uh, you listen to what Kevin just said, what Xi Jinping is seeing right now on the global stage is exactly the opposite. This would be a really bad time to try to suddenly push the issue, whether it's directly on Taiwan or more broadly towards a, an overtly confrontational stance towards the West, precisely because the West is so aligned, the G7 is so workable, China is on the back foot with the Russians, and many, many, and all the economic reasons that, that Kevin just mentioned. So assuming some level of rationality on the part of both of these actors, which I think is always a good way to start, mm -hmm. uh, that, that implies that Putin was going to be more of a risk taker, and Xi Jinping not so much, at least not right now. And I would certainly agree with you on that, but I would take it back to the Obama administration, and it's, it's rather, lack of response. To 2008? No, 2014, the Bush, uh, the Bush administration. And yeah, Georgia, Georgia, 2008, Bush, and then, and then Bush, yeah, but and, same, same and story, yeah. yeah. Although I, I'm not sure, and I would like to believe you were right, that one can necessarily think that the alliance would hold together if it were China and Taiwan. I mean, it's a very different economic circumstance, and the decoupling from China is very different from a decoupling from Russia. No, you're absolutely right. For my sins in the last month, I have many sins. The, um, I spent a lot of time. Would you like to talk about them now? That's okay. Yeah. And, and the privacy of the confessional, and for tickets to be sold at one side. The um, that's how it works in Australia. The um, uh, for my sins, I've been a fair bit of time in Europe in the last month, talking to our friends in Berlin and Paris and Brussels and London. If you can find a government in London. Um, <laughs> Um, you can. I'm, I'm told you now can. Is there, is there a government? Just barely. Good. The, uh, that is a good thing for all of us. The, um, that uh, all on this central question of um, uh, where they stand in terms of their individual and collective pan-European China strategies. Um, and it is a, um, an interesting voyage of discovery because uh, the ultimate question is uh, one school of European thought which goes into this line of thinking China, future, economic market opportunity, 
uh, Volkswagen, BMW, BASF, uh, Siemens Plus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Money, 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 I've got love in my tummy. Two, um, China equals strategic problem for US-led Western Alliance. Okay, Uncle Sam, your problem with your Asian allies, goodbye. Money, 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 I've got love in my tummy uh, with the China market. And thirdly, human rights problems in Tibet. Ah, we'll have a seminar on that at the Human Rights Council in Geneva. Problem solved in all three. Then there's an emerging view, however, in a number of European capitals that in fact, uh, what you've seen in fact with uh, the emergence of uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine um, is a precursor of a much more uh, aggressive global geopolitical reality, that China may actively be contemplating to do the same, that this would result in a change in the international rules-based system, uh, and furthermore, at a deeper level of national economic self-interest, asking themselves this question, um, is the China economic miracle permanent, or is Chinese growth beginning to peak? And within that, again, they ask this question, let's just say there is a shootout at the OK Corral <clears throat> over, um, over Taiwan, yeah. then under those circumstances, um, should we in Europe commit the same mistake as we've done with the Russians on gas, uh, where we became chronically dependent to a country which then became the subject of US-led sanctions? In which case, sanctions imposed against China's invasion of Taiwan would therefore fundamentally close the European market anyway under those circumstances. They're the two schools of thought, and they're all contending for preeminence. What's China's view of Europe? China's view of Europe, in my view, is they still see it as one huge wobbling bowl of marshmallow, um, and uh, that I quite know where it's going to settle. Um, and, uh, and you're about to see the mother of all Chinese charm offences uh, in Europe now that the 20th Party Congress is underway. I mean, I hate the idea of promoting someone's research who isn't on the stage, um, but Adam Tooze uh, on, uh, on Germany, China, uh, earlier today, his newsletter, absolute must read, and just talking about like these German companies and how incredibly reliant they are mm. on the Chinese economic market, whether it's BASF or Volkswagen, Siemens, I mean, the chip company. Volkswagen's you, 50%. It, it, yes, and, and, and their market share is problematic. They've, they were, it's I think five or six billion a year, now down to three, but they're, they're trying actively to localize a lot of their production and management in ways to make sure that they don't lose even more, that they turn it around. But the point is that the Germans, as well as an industrial base that is exporting to China, which is very different the nature of the US market, like you, the idea that the Americans are gonna tell the Germans, no, you're gonna just get on board with us on a broader decoupling as we define national security, that's just not on. And so I, I, I think that this is in part that it's hard to get the allies because they're not convinced that the Americans can truly be counted on over a long period of time, but in parts because there are really strong entrenched interests here that are actually very different. Um, and that's not just true with American European allies, of course, it's true with Japan, it's true with South Korea as well. So I did want to, following on, on this whole peak China debate, which I, it's sort of an emerging thing here, Ian, you've talked about a new technological cold war between the US and China. I mean, who's winning? Who's losing and how does the new chips bill fit into this and where do you fit into the peak China debate? Well, um, and I'm interested to hear uh, Kevin's view on this. this. This plays in a lot of different areas. Um, TSMC, in my view, is right now the most important company in the world, period. It's not Saudi Aramco, it's, there's no question. And uh, the Chinese are dependent on TSMC, but so, is the, so are the Americans. And if it's only 100 miles away from mainland China, it's not clear to me that the Americans want a fight over TSMC in the medium term. Because in the same way that the Chinese now have to invest massively to ensure that they have the capabilities, so do the Americans, right? I mean, there's a vulnerability there. And okay, maybe it turns out the Chinese with the, the indebtedness challenges and growth challenges they have, maybe they'll have a hard time actually ginning up enough cash to really be able to make up, to bridge the semiconductor gap with the West. We have the money in the United States, but it's unclear to me we have the political will and follow through in the United States. So I, I, I worry that this is not necessarily the time 
for us to want to have this fight. One, because of the political dysfunction in the US. Two, because before the Americans announced the semiconductor fight, the White House was trying to get the allies on board for months and didn't get them on board, and so decided to go ahead by themselves. And of course, there are also a lot of American companies that aren't as in bed as, say, BASF or Volkswagen, but nonetheless have a view towards China which is much closer to that of the German government than it is to that of the American government. And I, I worry that the reason why the semiconductor policy was comparatively easy to get on board is not just because it's uh, bipartisan in orientation, but also because the big tech firms in the United States are the companies that weren't able to get access to the Chinese market anyway. So a lot of them are very willing to lean into this in a way that the rest of the American private sector, whether you talk about the NBA or you talk about Walmart or Coca-Cola or Goldman Sachs, are saying no mas, or the Chinese equivalent, which, I mean, you can tell us what that is. What's the Chinese equivalent, no mas? What the hell is no mas? No mas is, that's not happening, no way. <laughs> what, what language is that? that? Well, that's not Chinese. I was just wondering what the man <laughs> is. Did you, did you just make up a language? I did, yeah, I did, yeah. yeah. It's not Japanese? No, 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 no. It's just, yeah. just Bremer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Okay. All right. No, just usually you give us like at least one or two solid Mandarin <laughs> phrases geopolitically. So I was hoping I could entice you to offer the first of those. There you go. No possibility. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. The, uh, can I throw in on that? Not the linguistic uh, duel. Um, dueling banjos or uh, dueling lexicons. Um, but uh, peak China uh, on the economy domestic and the question of uh, US-China economic decoupling and where it leads, brackets, Europe, uh, and do they join or not join. Pick China domestically, um, uh, the debate is just beginning. The fact we're having a debate about whether the Chinese economy is peaking is of itself, I think, the most significant point. In the last 20 or 30 years, none of us would regard such a debate topic as being relevant. And that's because we've had a consistent Chinese economic model, which has been firing basically on all cylinders for 20 or 30 years, you know, with some blips here and some problems there, but by and large generating double digit or near double digit growth, uh, including through a massive fiscal injection uh, during the global financial crisis. But uh, the truth is, um, and this predates COVID, uh, through a cocktail of factors, which is the, the accelerating impact of demographic change, aging, negligible birth rates, 1.16, the second lowest in Asia, plus exorbitant uh, costs of childcare, aged care, and everything, everything else care, means that um, there is a problem in terms of size of the workforce uh, and the impact on domestic consumption as well. Um, Xi Jinping then doubles down on the problems of demography with new problems of ideology. That's what I was writing about most recently in Foreign Affairs, which is this move to the Marxist left has horrified the Chinese private sector, where they've just said, Xiang Bu Dao. Who would have thought? There you go. Just, just, that is a real language, unlike no mas. No, no mas actually is a real language in defense of my other language. OK. Good on you. OK. But I did ask him what language it was. I know. Uh, was it Japanese? No. Okay. What was it? Spanish. It's Spanish. Yeah. But you knew that. You we're, knew that. We're at the Asian society. You're just being troublesome. <laughs> we're at the Asian society. We don't do Spanish at the Asian society. We're the, in the United uh, States. We do Spanish everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you win. <laughs> OK, 15, love. I lost. <laughs> Where were we? Uh, we were talking about uh, China's domestic economy. So you've got demography uh, doubling down against China. You've got ideology, uh, a question of political choice on Xi Jinping's part to go to the Marxist left and to abandon the Deng Xiaoping formula of 35 years of reform and opening. Private sector going effectively, increasingly, on an investment strike domestically. There's a Chinese word, second Chinese word for the occasion. It's a really important one, tangping. I mean, it's Chinese for lying flat. And lying flat is what uh, ping tang, tangping, no, it's tangping. Lying flat, which is what a whole bunch of younger people are now electing to do because they can't see their way ahead, but also a number of enterprises lying flat because they can't quite see where the next opportunities are going to come from. And far better to go out and play golf. 
roll into that COVID lockdowns and roll into that on net exports, the fact that you've got a slowing global economy. These are the four sets of factors which are causing economists the world over now to pose the question, is this historical assumption we've had about Chinese growth like that uh, into mid-century still sustainable? Or is it going to be a curve like that, which is the peak China debate? Don't know the answer yet, but in terms of any course correction of the 20 party Congress, there was none. On the second question, which is about decoupling and the, uh, the um, American decision to engage in the um, uh, bans on technology exports, Ian's exactly right. The administration worked on this for six to 12 months, trying to get uh, the allies on board. Didn't work entirely well, because none of them did. So they've done it unilaterally in the expectation they can leverage the allies on board uh, from this point on. It'll be a work in progress. Obviously, the case study is what happened with 5G. But 5G is a vastly different uh, kettle of fish than this one, because it's about actually denying technology imports now in the real world, not what infrastructure you build for advanced um, uh, um, uh, telecommunications. So this is still a story which will unfold. Why have they done it now? I think they reached a strategic conclusion that China was progressively narrowing the gap in semiconductors in particular, and the other five to 10 technology categories they analyzed most carefully, and concluded that a strategic action was necessary. I think when the history is written of this period, the decision by the administration on the 7th of October to ban high technology imp uh, exports to China. Tipping point. Uh, is a tipping point. Yeah, great. It is a central development which we will look back on in the evolution of not just technological decoupling but wider economic decoupling. I think the, the Schultz speech um, after the uh, Russian invasion uh, was a turning point for NATO and for Europe in the end of the peace dividend and I agree completely with Kevin that the US decision is a turning point in the US-China relationship. I would remind us that when Biden first announced he was running for the presidency, he disparaged China as irrelevant and, their t and, and having no technological capabilities compared to the Americans. And, and, and everyone was stunned, saying, well, how, how could Biden possibly believe that? And I, I think that over the course of the last couple of years, he has absolutely gotten educated on the fact that what the China he used to know um, has actually caught up with the Americans in all sorts of core technologies and is actually ahead of the Americans in some that matter. The interesting thing is that when you talk to the German chancellor, he believes still as a, you know, someone from Hamburg and very much aligned with their, you know, industry, um, that actually China is not relevant technologically and they can't get their act together and he needs to get up to speed. So, I mean, this is a fast moving transition and whether or not the Chinese can get there, I do believe the American intelligence agencies now see this as a principal national security threat to the Americans. Cannot be in an environment where the Chinese are potentially dominant in core technologies would make the Americans too vulnerable and Biden has been convinced of that. So I'm going to date myself in my age here, which is having covered uh, technology export regimes in the 1980s and watched, let's not sell supercomputers to the Russians until we got to the point, there used to be a company called Radio Shack. Um, we got to the point in which you there's, could- There's still a Twitter account, by the way, which I do not recommend you follow for those of you who know what I'm talking about. You got to the point in which you buy a faster computer, basically at Radio Shack, than you know, what we were still stopping IBM from exporting to, to Russia. I mean, the idea that you can somehow stop technology from being exported, I'm pretty skeptical about. And that's the first thing. I, I think, think the view of the administration, though, is they can't stop it, they can slow it. And, um, and if the critical timeline here is what I've long believed to be Xi Jinping's preferred timetable for moving on Taiwan, which is the 2030s, to be militarily much more prepared, to be technologically resilient, uh, and to be financially and economically as independent of the impact of US sanctions as possible. I think the US sees this as a slowing device, not a 
not an ultimate blocking device for the reasons you've just indicated. I, I agree with that. Um, but I also think the Americans have a very significant problem in the sense that American technology companies are not necessarily patriotic. Oh. And, and, their, <laughs> and their willingness to align with US national security policy on this is all over the map. Um, I mean, we've seen this play out, again, in Russia. If you go and ask the White House, what countries are doing the most to support Ukraine? They will say, number one, the US, number two, the UK, number three, Microsoft, number four, Poland, in that order. Microsoft's number three, very interesting, right? Uh, about three, four months ago, they would have put Starlink on that list. They won't now. Um, and that has nothing to do with US national security. It has to do with the decision-making process of one guy. And I, you know what happens if there's a different CEO, or there's a different business model? How do you, as the Americans, get these technology companies to actually get on board with the idea that you are not only going to not do certain types of business with the Chinese, uh, which you can legislate to a degree, but also that you are going to invest in the certain types of things that are going to be aligned with the Americans. We are very far from that, in part because the U.S. government doesn't understand what a lot of those things are. The decisions are being made. I mean, the reason why Microsoft is so important to the Ukrainians is because they took it on themselves to stand up the Ukrainian cloud after the NotPetya attacks by the Russians. But it wasn't like NATO had a really good sense of what needed to be done on cyber. Tech companies just happened to do it. So th this, is, this makes the fact that you have technology companies as functionally sovereign actors in the digital space and that that becomes increasingly critical when we talk about national security is actually going to be a fundamental nexus of whether American geopolitical strategy on this issue is successful or not. The Chinese have different problems. It's efficiency. It's can they continue to, you know, have the goose that lays the golden eggs as they politically strangle or constrain it. But there's no problem with the companies being patriotic and being aligned with national security. Like, that's not their problem. Well, we legislated this in the, in, the Cold War, in the Cold War. I think the problem on Capitol Hill is that nobody understands technology. That's right. That's absolutely and, right. And so, I mean, if you look at the Facebook hearings, we don't we'd want to get there. There's one broader point there on uh, Ian's uh, question about what he described as the patriotism of US uh, technology firms. And that is, can you bring up along the economic establishment, private economic establishment of this country to support a long-term coherent US national security strategy on China? That's that element of it. There's a broader element, which is, can the United States bring along its allies um, to uh, play ball in a similar range of, shall we say, restrictive economic actions? Uh, first uh, volume in this particular playbook, as I said before, was 5G. The second volume is now unfolding, uh, which is uh, what happens with the list of technology bans announced on 7 October and the efforts by the administration now to internationalise. But the third is actually when you start unpacking the uh, detailed contents of the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA. I love the way you Americans call your legislation strange things. <laughs> like, what's it got to do with inflation reduction, that whole thing? Very little. Thank you. Yeah. I thought I was, I think I was missing something. Anyway, if you look at its two big engines, which is kind it's of the chip. It's called Jedi mind tricks. But... Jedi mind tricks. That's, uh, well, fool me. So, uh, so you've got the Chips Act bit, and you've got the uh, renewable technology bit. Both of these are huge instruments of American industrial policy, which subsidise American industry now hugely at the expense of lots of allies. <laughs> at the expense of the allies. So I was recently... But the South Koreans were pissed about this. They, um, and the Europeans are increasingly pissed about uh, I couldn't use that word, but the Europeans were upset. Deeply. <laughs> Deeply upset. The, um, the, uh, and, and in India, where I have been recently, uh, when they t looked at the fine print of what the level of subsidy will now be under the uh, renewable energy provisions of the IRA, and this massive subsidy to American green hydrogen when they're seeking to kickstart their own green hydrogen industry. And the impact that has on investor confidence there as subsidised American firms then move into the global marketplace, replete with their own national subsidies. My overall macro message to the United States, if you're serious about a long-term national China strategy, the assumption up until now is we'll all march together on national security. And when it comes to everyone's economic interests, it's the law of the jungle 
but we will set the rules and we'll have whatever subsidies we want. That is not sustainable in the domestic democratic politics of your allies. So if the United States wants to change that, this deep rethink, which is to regard uh, geopolitical security and strategy as being separate uh, from, let's call it the international economy, is not tenable. Critical point. They, they either have to be this or they don't prevail, because China simultaneously globally, is still prevailing. Because the US does not have trade policy. That's right. You don't have a trans-Pacific partnership. You, don't, you can't explain what your Indo-Pacific economic framework actually is. The Democrats and Republicans back and forth on these issues, the allies do not find this remotely acceptable, whether it's Canada on infant formula or, or whether it's you know, sort of the Europeans on steel. or I mean, These are all problems. I agree completely. And if you mention free trade on Capitol Hill these days, you think the Salem witch trials are about to be visited upon you because it's so popular. And the tomato tariffs, of course. Yeah. yeah. And we're still fighting about softwood lum lumber with the Canadians 40 years later, but which That's does... a very obscure reference, by yes. the way. We didn't go over it. It's okay. So, which leads us to this question of President Biden's going to be in Asia this week. Um, and next, first in Phnom Penh for the annual U.S. ASEAN Summit and the East Asia Summit, and then Bali ah, for the G20 Summit, where he may or may not, but we believe he is going to meet with Xi. Yep. So for all of the talk of a pivot to Asia 2.0, this administration has not surprisingly been consumed with what's been happening in Europe. Very quickly, because we're going to run out of time, and I do want to get to the midterms just for a little bit. Um, he can do the midterms. Um, you can both it's way beyond, my, okay. way beyond my pay grade. Um, you know, Biden, this is, goes exactly to the core of you know, the issues that are going to come up in Biden's meetings. What message does Biden have to bring to these meetings with the allies? Well, let's be clear that the G20 is going to be the most fraught and fascinating G20 since the global financial crisis. Um, and there is one big question about the G20, and that is, is Putin there? Hmm. He Supposedly, he's going. It is, this is an impossible situation either way, because if he goes, the G7 will not engage with him directly. It will be Im immensely embarrassing for him. He will be waiting like he was for the Kyrgyz president at the SCO, cooling his heels. The Chinese, other friends of his, are not as close and as warm as they were before. I mean, this is nothing compared to Mohammed bin Salman post Khashoggi showing up at the, at the G20s. Nothing like that. But if he doesn't show up, MBS would be keen for Putin to show up. Oh, absolutely. He's the one. He's the one that's going to be hanging with him. But even that's kind of problematic for MBS given everything else. And yet, if he doesn't, if Putin doesn't show, then the, it's all Russia all the time at the G20 and the G7 working very hard to get increasingly skittish uh, friends in the developing world on board for this war that has to end, as Xi Jinping told Schultz directly. We want this war to be over now. They were surprised, the Germans were surprised with how much he was willing to do this. So let's be clear, as much as the Americans don't have much of a consolidated Asia strategy outside of security right now, the, the issue du jour for the G20 will be Putin. And one way or the other, that's gonna take up all the oxygen in the room, it's gonna be fascinating, but deeply, deeply destructive. And one other thing I would say, and I normally don't think about this, but the fact is that the, where this war is going to go, and even whether or not a tactical nuclear weapon is used, has a lot to do with Putin's own personality, feeling of being cornered or being humiliated. So the way this G20 plays out might be the most important summit of our lifetimes, right? And we, we, need, to, we need to think of it in those terms. I, I'm, I'm fascinated by it, but I'm also a little terrified by it. Um, we, we, we have, Putin is not in a good place right now, and there aren't many people who are thinking about it from his perspective. The tricky thing about a G20, having, uh, when I was Prime Minister, being the co-founder of it and been to a number of them over the years, is the table's not all that large. When people say, you know, we're not having anything to do with him, it's like the table will fit on this stage and the Russians are sitting there and whoever, whoever organises the seating plan, um, there's going to be a bunch of G7 and other democratic world countries on this side as far as, as possible. But the table is not such that you can simply ignore somebody who's sitting over there. 
there will inevitably be an exchange. There will inevitably be a discussion, whatever the Indonesians do as, uh, as the host. My hope uh, is that uh, Putin decides not to go. Uh, I think that is also the Indonesian hope, though they'll never say that. They're the hosts. I think that is also the Chinese hope, but they'll never say that because of, we've seen this series of actions now by China seeking to leverage uh, the Russians uh, into, as it were, uh, a peace trajectory over Ukraine, um, as, uh, as we've seen most recently over tactical nukes. But I think the key message uh, or the key significance of the G20 in Bali, I hate to say this, but it's not just because we're at the Asia Society, is actually not to do with Russia. Um, and this is where I partly have, am disagreeing with, uh, with Ian. Uh, I think it will primarily be to do with whether or not China and the United States find a mechanism to start stabilising the relationship as opposed to the continued structural spiral down of this relationship, which has been in free fall for the last three years. In aggregate geopolitics, and we're here to talk about the risks posed by both, but, but all three countries in this strategic triangle, it is the China-US trajectory which frightens the hell out of me longer term. The Russian one frightens me less if the nuke question is off the table, but you've got horizontal escalation dangers in terms of a fight with NATO. But the thing I'm focused on is whether they're going to look at a formula to authorise their officials to put some stabilising guardrails around the relationship. Don't know whether they will, um, but I think the mood in both capitals, as I said earlier in our discussion today, is to take the temperature down a notch or two um, for the short to medium term, uh, because neither of them want to end up in an accidental war in the short to medium term, and there's so much other stuff. Um, which is problematic. Yeah, Ke Kevin's point, I mean, certainly what comes out of the U.S.-China relationship is the most important issue, broader, strategically, long term. My fear is that what happens around Russia and Putin is actually much more of a dangerous tail risk in the near term mm -hmm. and increasingly does reflect that. So uh, whether or not you agree with my or Kevin's perspective there in part depends on your filter. I definitely agree with Kevin that it's better for everyone if Putin doesn't go. Caveat, he won't just not go. He needs a reason not to go. And I hope that the reason that he gives not to go is not a false flag, is not a, an injustice that has just been performed against him that is fake, but he has been talking about over the course of the last month. For example, a dirty bomb being used. And, and, and Kevin asked, he said, like, well, why is it that the White House has suddenly been talking about all of this? It was directly in response to Defense Minister Shoigu going around and not just mentioning, oh, they're going to use a dirty bomb, but demanding bilateral meetings with the Europeans and the Americans and the Indians and the Chinese saying, we have this serious information, they're going to do this, we're going to bring it to the Security Council. That's unusual for Russia, unless there's something behind it. And the something is not the Ukrainians are about to do it. The something is the Russians are looking for an excuse. Excuse for what? We don't know. But the problem is that Putin doesn't have the ability to actually turn the war in his favor on the ground. He doesn't have that capacity. We know that. So what else is he going to do? Um, at least with US-China, there are lots of reasons to slow the deterioration or, or stabilize. Maybe not to build lots of trust, but at least to get off of what looks like a a sudden train wreck. Putin's perspective on the war right now doesn't have those incentives, which is why when I think about the G20, that's what I'm focusing on. So it seems minor by comparison with dirty bombs and, and larger potential for conflict with China, but certainly we have Asian allies who are going to be looking to the president to say something, to give them some reassurance here. And we seem to have ceded the space when it comes to trade policy. We're just not engaging, as you said. We, we have no trade policy. And we have these weird acronyms for things that really aren't, they're not trade, they're, they're not trade agreements. And they're supposed to be rules of conduct, um, but they're rules of conduct which, with no incentives attached to them. What do you think everybody else in Asia wants to hear from Biden, um, particularly because it looks like the pivot once again has been stalled because we're, it's all Ukraine all the time. 
I think there's two things. Um, one, the president can't deliver because he's a Democrat and not a Democrat and a Republican. And that is the long-term continuity of US uh, strategic uh, direction on China uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. Because at the back of every regional government's mind is, what if Trump returns, or a Trump-like figure does return to the White House? Will all that has been required of American allies up until now be rendered null and void? So the president can be reassuring on this question, and to be fair to the administration, the strategy so far, despite its missing economic component, which I'll go on to, has been remarkably coherent and remarkably bipartisan so far, particularly given where we were at the end of the Trump administration in terms of China strategy. If you aggregated what Blinken has said on China strategy, what Sullivan has said in the national security strategy, what's in now Lloyd Austin's national defense strategy, and we can debate about the impact, but the, um, the elements of the um, technology import, export bans announced on the 7th of October, these fit within a framework. The question in the Allies' mind is, is it sustainable politically? On the second point, which they'll be looking for from the President, and he'll be hard-pressed to be deliver anything of substance on this, it's to try and prise open the door that was slammed shut on the first day of the Trump presidency, which was the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, a genuine free trade agreement for the area, for the region. Um, Gina Raimondo, I think, has done an extraordinary job in uh, given the absence of any interest in the Congress or the administration on market access uh, to pull together what is called IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Um, and if you look at its three or four pillars, uh, there is an opportunity to develop at least one of those pillars in terms of pan-regional digital commerce regimes. That's got some legs. Um, but it ain't market access. And I go back to the point I made much earlier strategically. Until the United States of America, until Uncle Sam finally works out that its allies are not dumb, uh, they're not stupid, and they cannot be treated as economic idiots, uh, compartmentalising totally their economic interests and having them, uh, as it were, roadkill um, uh, in, uh, in, the, um, in the prosecution of a wider US national security strategy. Uh, CHIPS Act, whatever else Act. Until America crosses that Rubicon and regards this as a pan-allied question of market access, the democracies of Asia, the democracies of Europe, the democracies of this hemisphere, um, then China has this residual strategic advantage because of its expanding global economic footprint. The most thrilling defense of IPEF I've heard so far. Uh, I read my briefing note from the White House. So. <laughs> you, I wasn't going to ask you to predict tomorrow, but I'm going to do it. You're an odds maker. Yeah. What's your spread? Oh, I mean, look, the, the problem we have is that um, the United States is going to look so much less coherent, so much less competent than what the Americans have shown on the global stage over the last nine months in response to Russia. Uh, and this has an impact. Um, you know, the, the fact is that Biden has, has framed this election as you are voting for the Democrats or you're voting against democracy. Now, I think that's a very unfortunate frame for a couple of reasons. First of all, because you only make a frame like that if you are either fairly certain you're gonna win or you're desperate. Well, he's not gonna win. Um, and he's not actually desperate. So, I mean, they're, they're doing this as if they're, you know, sort of voter testing it short term, but the reality is it's gonna make them look weak after the election is over, and he has to stand up and say, well, I guess the Americans aren't in favor of democracy anymore. Like, well, what the hell is that, right? So that's number one. And number two, it's just not true. The Democratic leadership has not governed as if they are concerned about the future of democracy. They're governing as if it's any normal administration. They're focusing on the IRA and they want to get, they want to get just regular pieces of legislation done. And I'll go further than that. The fact that Democratic leadership in the party were prepared to actually fund election deniers to win Republican primaries 
so that they'd have an easier chance going up against them. That is not something you do if you're fearful that democracy is coming to an end. That's something you do when you're just thinking about the gamesmanship of politics as usual. Let's be clear, right? So, yeah, I mean, even in a Democrat Manhattan crowd, you will get people, because it's the Upper East Side, you will get people <laughs> that will applaud or laugh to those two points. Um, the, the, the issue, we're well healed here, we're well healed at the Asian Society. Um, but <laughs> we're, we're, we're well socked as well. We're, we're well definitely socked. well socked. <laughs> no, but I, I, I do, I really do worry, of course, that as much as, I mean, Kevin was talking about the fact that we'll just power through it like we did with 5G on semiconductors and allies will get on board with us. And the feeling is that they will do that because we've got the power. And it is true that American power on these issues is undiminished, but American credibility is seriously diminished. And, and we can't pretend that that doesn't matter. The fact that the United States just doesn't have a leg to stand on as a representative democracy in terms of values with our allies, never mind our adversaries, that, that I mean, that's a serious hit to American power. And let's also remember that, I mean, I hate to say this, I really do, but the presidential race starts tomorrow. And, ugh, I mean, two years of that, who wants that? Nobody here wants that, but it's going to be ugly. It's going to be unpleasant. It's going to be dysfunctional. It's going to make America look weak, divided, and incompetent. We're going to have two years of one of the most brutal and nasty and un-American, to the extent that, that means anything anymore, um, uh, you know, fights that we've ever experienced in our lives. And you think that's not going to have an impact on our allies? Of course it will. Of course it will. I think Biden's going to look terribly weak as a consequence of that, and that he's going to get caught in the crossfire, and it's going to be bad for us. Can I add two footnotes to that? Yes, please. Uh, as a mere foreign observer uh, to, to the way in which uh, you guys conduct your marvellous, if somewhat chaotic, democracy. Um, all democracies are chaotic, uh, and it's better than the alternative. You had your own level of chaos. Yes, for about. All, dem all democracies are chaotic. And, uh, and we're reminded of uh, Churchill's aphorism, the worst system of government in the world except for all the others, um, is that um, Ian is right, the world will be looking intently at how this country governs itself for the next two years. Uh, whether you like it or not, and I fear that some in Washington won't care that the world is actually looking closely. But it's one of those er periods in history where the world will be looking not just closely, but intently. Uh, and if they begin to form conclusions that the country lurches towards <coughs> ungovernability uh, for the long term, that has profound global strategic uh, consequences. Um, the other thing, though, I'd say, though, is that you know, there's still a healthy respect around the world for the automatic stabilizers of the American system. That is, your democracy um, self-corrects, like all of our democracies self -corrects. The question is whether you throw up a series of results, either in the midterms or in the next presidential, which throw it way beyond the parameters of normal self-correction. Um, and that's where the analysis will be. My final point is the danger on the China angle is this. Uh, I do worry that Xi Jinping, having had his narrow electoral win himself at the National People's Congress, um, um, minus the Hu Jintao vote, it seems, the, uh, <laughs> the former general secretary, the, um, that, uh, and I'd caution our Chinese friends against this, is not to assume that Biden arrives in Bali with America structurally or strategically weakened. That would be the wrong conclusion. There's something about the robustness of the United States foreign and security policy establishment will not permit that. But I sometimes worry in some of the hubristic commentary within China about the state of the American democracy that it leads to a strategic conclusion that this country is somehow now ungovernable, which is not the case. And this is, as Ian noted, this has been one of the extraordinary things, particularly in the wake of Afghanistan, about Ukraine, is that with all the anxiety that everyone felt about US leadership in the wake of Trump, when is Trump coming back? Biden blew Afghanistan so terribly. I mean, this, the relief in Europe about American leadership, there's certainly still a hunger for that. They've done a fantastic job. They have kept the Europeans informed and engaged every step of the way. 
Um, they are sharing their concerns. Uh, they are, uh, and, and it, and it two tracks simultaneously, because there's a recognition that there is not full alignment with Zelensky, but there's also an understanding that to push him too hard too soon risks the alliance. I, I, I give the Biden administration absolute top marks in the way they have responded to this crisis post February 24th. Top marks. And on that scaling thing, as you go to the audience, Afghanistan, fail by the administration no on all measures, and including the perception of the allies. Um, China strategy, um, seven and a half out of 10, given where it was at the end of the Trump administration. It's coherent, it has allied buy-in in Asia and in Europe, but it's got an emerging huge hole in it called the economy. Uh, thirdly, Ukraine, I agree with you, this is a nine out of 10 um, you know, delivery by the administration in holding this extraordinary coalition together so far. The question which neither of us have touched, and we probably won't get a chance to do so today, is what's the final negotiated outcome uh, in Ukraine to uh, finally see this thing um, dealt with? I'll have to come back and do that, or maybe that'll be one of the questions. So there are people with microphones. I cannot see a thing out there because they're so strong. So um, we have time. For Concise questions, please, because we'd like to get as many in as possible. And question one. There's a question over here. I can see a chap's got his hand up. About two or three in front of you. There you go. There's a mic coming to you, sir. Historically, to what extent do you believe NATO could have or should have acted more in Russia's interests, and if so, when and how? Um, the way I would describe that, I think there were two different points of missing the boat on Russia. Um, the first is that in the Yeltsin days and early Putin days, um, the ability, the interest in making the NATO-Russia Joint Council into more than it actually was, more than a fig leaf, trying to really integrate them, um, I think would have been useful. The idea of doing more than just shock therapy, but trying to actually help rebuild the Russian economy um, would have made a difference. So one is the active pull. The other is the push. Uh, I think the idea under Bush of um, inviting uh, the Georgians and the Ukrainians to be a part of NATO, especially over fairly sharp reservations of other NATO allies in Europe, was a bridge too far um, and uh, was uh, kind of a rag um, to, uh, to a bull uh, that the Russians were going to have major structural issues with, but without creating the deterrent. Because if you're saying we're going to let you in, but you don't let them in, then they don't actually have any of the guarantees, the security guarantees that would prevent the Russians from invading. And again, we saw that in 08 in Georgia, we saw it in 14 in Ukraine, and then we saw it again in 2022. So I would say that at the margins, both of those things were mistakes. But those were, that, that is not to say that Putin is anything less than 100% responsible for the unjust invasion of a sovereign territory on February 24th. I want to be clear about that. There's someone there, gentleman in the middle, and you're, I'm just more used to this stage. I can spot people. <laughs> Thanks very much. I just want to bring up something that hasn't been mentioned and ask your opinion about that. COP27, are climate off the table completely now? Let me answer on climate. The, um, um, if you look carefully at what uh, Xi Jinping had to say in the 20th Party Congress on climate and uh, go through his work report, um, there is no what I identify to be uh, backsliding from the previous Chinese position, either on his three big commitments, which is carbon neutrality by 2060, carbon peaking by 2020, and no further export or funding of, um, uh, uh, did I say 2020, I meant 2030, um, uh, no further funding of um, or through the Belt and Road Initiative of, of uh, coal-fired power stations abroad. So there's nothing in the document which uh, walks back from that. Um, he has a phrase in the document which has been used elsewhere but it's now been elevated, 
which concerns me because it says we should not uh, bring, we should not retire the old until we have brought on the new. Um, and that's been around for a while, but it's now been elevated to party congress report status. That is partly a, an amber light to green light to the coal-fired power station lobby within the country to keep burning until you're confident that installed capacity from renewables and with batteries can do the job. So I fear that may slow the transition. Um, as far as the international collaboration is concerned, I hope um, that one of the outcomes of Bali, if there's a summit between uh, Xi Jinping and uh, Biden, which I assume is going to proceed, is to find some stabilisation mechanism that given it occurs almost contemporaneously with Sharm el Sheikh and COP27, which is being held there um, imminently, or now, now yeah. um, that, um, that um, uh, some sort of uh, mechanism is found to reopen the lines between Xie Jinhua and John Kerry, um, uh, which, which was suspended after the Pelosi, visit, the Pelosi visit to Taiwan and, and China's retaliatory actions then. So not a brilliant set of outcomes, but I see uh, some possibilities still emerging. I mean, my personal concern here, of course, we haven't talked about this, but the debt limit could possibly be a major crisis if the Republicans take back the House, which it looks like they will. And they're talking about rolling back potentially part of the Inflation Reduction Act mm. as the price of this. And so major green possibilities there we could see. I think I, the, the willingness to actually roll it back is very, very low because people, once they actually see subsidies, uh, their constituents are very happy with them. So <laughs> that, that I'm not worried about. Okay. They're, 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 f they're domestic constituents, not their foreign constituents. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right you haven't mentioned, uh, there's there's a um, thing there. You haven't mentioned yet uh, Latin America and, uh, and Africa. In this geopolitical struggle that you're describing, are they important flanks to the struggle, or are they not actually that relevant? I do LATAM, you do Africa. Okay. So uh, on our on our grading scale, um, I would have given the Biden administration like maybe a three um, on LATAM so far. The uh, uh, summit of the Americas was a non-event that we probably shouldn't have held. Um, despite the fact that uh, most of the leaders in the region are ideologically simpatico uh, with the Biden administration. Um, there is uh, not a strategy uh, for, for the region. Um, there's some efforts on containing migration. Frankly, Trump was more successful uh, because he was willing to wield more of a fist and be more transactional with the Mexicans on that front um, than, uh, than the Biden administration. Um, if I think about Venezuela, there are some uh, options for the Biden administration at the margins because we're gonna start to see negotiations now with the opposition that will lead to some marginal additional oil production through Chevron, a couple hundred thousand barrels uh, a day. It does, it's not gonna make a difference. But meanwhile, you've got the Colombians actively opening the border and engaging in bilateral negotiations. Why aren't the Americans in front on that issue? They should be, they could be, they're not. So I think this has been a, look, you've got the, the Russia issue, the China issue, transatlantic relations, big problems with the Iranians, the Saudi thing blew up. I just think Latin America is not getting a lot of attention from the Biden administration, that's unfortunate. I think if you look to the um, geoeconomics and the geopolitics, the fact is with 1.1 billion people in the African continent and 600 million in Latin America, am I right? Thereabouts. The, um, um, the United States cannot afford to have these as missing elements of its global strategy. Secondly, if I look at China's global strategy, the things I mapped recently in that book that I've written called The Avoidable War, China's strategy. It's a shot right there, just so it's a shot. Thank a shot. you very much. It's a promotion. It's a very good book. <laughs> and if you buy a dozen copies, I'll send you free steak knives. <laughs> the, um, I'm now into retail. I have no shame. The, um, but if, uh, as I recorded in a book recently, the, um, the uh, China's strategy in each of these um, regions is comprehensive, and it is driven by trade investment as well as plus various plus one arrangements. And so the missing, the missing elements of, of US global strategy 
is the continent, Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East. It seems that uh, the United States global strategy at present vis-a-vis uh, -vis China is focused on, let's call it uh, Asia, uh, the Pacific and Indian Oceans plus Europe. Uh, and that is an asymmetry in the way in which uh, these things are being prosecuted. And if you speak to our Latin American friends and our African colleagues, uh, the foreign direct investment flows from China are significant. If you go to the next, next door to the United States and the Caribbean, Caribbean, the FDI flows out of China now across all the island states is huge relative to residual investments from this country. So uh, it's, um, and it's not as if these regions have intrinsically turned against the United States, they haven't. But let me tell you, that, as Ian said before, there is a sense of structural and strategic neglect, uh, which I think is something which needs fundamentally to be redressed. There's a gentleman here in the front as well, he's got two fingers up. Makes it an urgent question, right? The two urgent question. question. Yeah. Well, in well, Australia, when the is. two fingers are up, it usually means something else. Oh, yeah, that's the <laughs> point, actually. Yeah. Uh, there appears to have been confirmation out of Russia itself that they have indeed been meddling uh, with elections. How serious is this? How, what is the impact? Or is this really the big question for Elon Musk? <laughs> <laughs> well, since he's not here, let me take that. Um, <laughs> You, you, guys, the, you guys are very tight, I understand. It wouldn't be the first time, exactly. Um, I thought you were Elon's spokesman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, uh, I, I think we all need to recognize that no one can do damage to the American elections the way the Americans can internally. Um, this is, um, yes, there were, there were efforts um, in the run-up of 2016 to provide disinformation. There was a Facebook group. I remember Black Lives Matter face like group with 450,000 members. It was the largest such group. It turned out to be a Russian cutout, and it was uh, actively trying to stoke racial dissent. Uh, that those sorts of things disturbed me greatly, but nothing close to the level of dissent, disharmony, hatred, growth of white nationalism. I mean, all, all of these things inside the United States. That's our problem. And yes, what I have seen so far um, from the new ownership of Twitter um, implies a greater level of, uh, of, of uh, anger, hatred, and, uh, and, and social media promoted violence um, on our country, on our civil society. I don't think this is Elon's intention. I think it happens to be incidental to the business model. That's a problem. It's not just a Twitter issue. It's a Facebook issue, social media issue. We, for a very long time in this country, um, have been allowing A-B testing to occur on ourselves, the body politic, and on our kids, not on the basis of what's better for civil society, but on the basis of what's more addictive to ensure that our data can be controlled and sold. No one needs to tell anybody here that that's bad for our democracy, right? I don't, I, I don't believe I just stepped on an applause line. That's horrible. That's why I don't run for anything. But, but uh, it, it, it is very clear to me that um, the combination of the disunity of the country right now and the social media platforms that have more influence than they ever had before not only is a principle a fundamental danger to US democracy that's far greater than China or Russia is, but also happens to be one of the principal exports of the United States globally that is undermining the democracy of our allies. We need to take this more seriously, in my view, than anything else affecting us in this country post these elections. No, in the spirit of non-interference, I won't comment on the state of America's domestic democracy. So I, th I think uh, Ian said it all. I think we have time for one more question. There is a, there's a lady up the front here. Thank you very much for a wonderful conversation. And I have to ask the question, how do you see the outcome of the war in Ukraine? 
Um, okay, I'll start, but you have to answer this too. Um, look, I, I think like so many things in the world today, we're not looking for sudden harmony and peace. We're looking for an off-ramp. We're looking for stabilization. We want to stop the escalation. So can we do that? In the near term, I think we can do that. I think that the Russian 300,000 troops that are going to the front lines can't take territory. They won't be well armed or trained, but they might be able to dig in and prevent the, the Ukrainians from breaking through and surrounding Crimea or even attacking it. I think that is the most likely outcome in the next two to four months, especially talking about winter months with a lot of Ukrainian suffering and with no ground cover, so you need to dig in as opposed to places where you're exposed and satellites can hit you. So I could see a situation in the next couple months where the front lines don't move very much and it looks like we don't talk about Ukraine as much in the headlines as a consequence. But that's phase one. I still don't see in that environment any negotiated breakthrough. I don't see, in that, I mean, I just was looking at uh, Russian ports today, and I saw that St. Petersburg, uh, since the war started, is actually doing about 10% of the volume that they were doing last year. Um, I know that the Russians are producing about 3% of the automobiles this year that they were producing last year. Uh, this is an economy that is going to be cut off from the West the way Iran has, as Kevin said. That's not a 5% contraction. That's a 40, 50% contraction over the next, say, five years. I, I don't see anything good coming of that. We have never decoupled a G20 economy from the West before. We're, we're doing it now. And it's Putin's fault, but we're doing it now. So, I mean, as much as I see a near-term likelihood of some level of stabilization, I fear that the medium term is incredibly dangerous. And this is where we're going to need to work with the Chinese and the Indians and the Turks and the Kazakhs and others that actually do still have direct engagement with Putin to see if there is a way to prevent them from massively escalating what is otherwise a downward spiral. Because if you think about what Iran means for the Middle East, they're a rogue state with ballistic missile attacks, drone strikes, espionage, proxy wars, radicalism, terrorist violence, you name it. Well, if Russia is that for NATO with 6,000 nuclear warheads, that really does not bode well for the next five, 10 years or for our kids. It really doesn't. And so I, I think, yes, there is a real possibility of a Cuban missile crisis in the next eight weeks. I think it's 5%, the White House thinks it's more like 20%. Either way, those numbers are way too freaking high. But I also think there is this one, two, three, five year danger that is massive and certainly is unprecedented post the wall coming down in 89. And we don't yet know how to manage that. While we're trying to manage down the Cuban Missile Crisis risk with a lot of effort for the near term. The medium term, I don't see anyone yet doing anything on the medium term. Well, if there's a 20% risk of a Cuban missile crisis, I'm glad we bought a lot of booze for the reception out here. So we probably all need a stiff drink after this. The, um, a few thoughts on Ukraine, uh, and then we'll draw our conversation to a close, because I'm mindful that people have had the commitments as well. First is, we need to be mindful of what US and Ukrainian strategic objectives are, and where they are consistent and where they partly differ. But the US strategic objective up until now and its European allies by and large has been along these lines. And for example, your Asian allies as well. We have about 150, this is Australia, we have about 150 armoured personnel carriers in Ukraine at the moment as part of the international effort. But the objective has been um, to uh, enable through resupply and training and US intelligence uh, to enable Ukraine to defend itself, uh, to reclaim territory lost, um, and so that it does not accede to Putin's war ambitions, either phase one or phase two. And to do so without triggering a general war with NATO. Uh, this is an extraordinarily delicate balancing act for which I commend the administration. This is really hard stuff. 
Next time you see Jake Sullivan on television, he looks as if he hasn't been to sleep for two weeks. That's probably because Jake hasn't been to sleep for two weeks because it is really hard stuff day to day to calibrate it uh, so that you achieve that uh, clear political objective without crossing the tripwire to a general war. Um, second, therefore, if the Ukrainians continue to succeed on the battlefront um, and reclaim uh, those large slices of territory they lost uh, outside the Donbass, both to the northeast of the country and the, nor and, uh, the southeast, um, then there is nothing wrong with that. But the point then comes what happens with the future of the Donbass and the future of Crimea. And the real question for the future of negotiations is uh, do the parties at an appropriate time agree that there is some form of landing point around Crimea and Donbass uh, remaining with the Russians, that the rest of Ukrainian territory being restored to Ukraine that the Ukraine joins the European Union, that the Ukraine that Ukraine is then put on a, as it were, long-term waiting list for NATO membership pending Russian future strategic behaviour. The creative imagination which is now necessary to begin to put, as it were, the architecture around that is really important. And I'm not advocating that as the landing point. All I'm saying is sooner or later negotiators are going to have to address the ugliness of what the landing point is. So that is a task, as Ian said quite correctly, involves a whole range of unlikely intermediaries, including the Turkish Republic, who at present under Erdogan, who, or whoever succeeds him, uh, have managed to sustain good offices with uh, the various um, conflicting parties. And finally, to do the third thing on the way through, which is uh, to ensure that not only do we not have vertical escalation, that is the use of nuclear weapons, and I'm more confident of that now than I was last week, uh, in part because of the Chinese intervention. The Chinese, the Russians were to lose the Chinese politically, diplomatically, economically by Putin using a nuclear device, uh, then frankly Putin has nowhere to go. I'm more concerned, as Ian said at the very outset, about future uh, means by which they horizontally escalate with um, NATO countries at large, not th with tanks rolling across the border, but through every other means of, of uh, below the radar a military and a paramilitary engagement, including bringing down infrastructure. So um, that's my best analysis of where it goes to from here. I think we're... This level of alignment is extraordinary, really. <laughs> All right. Not just among the broader allies, but specifically right here this evening. That's great. <laughs> oh.